Have you ever been told that you are bad at something? Because sometimes it lights a fire in you to be the best that you can be at that very thing. When I was a master's student at Stanford University, my advisor told me that I was a bad scientist. <laughs> so after working in industry for a couple of years, I decided, well, at the very least, I should be a bad scientist with a PhD. <laughs> so I joined the research group of Professor Bill Nix, also at Stanford University, who is affectionately known as the boss. And together with the boss, we discovered something very unusual. We discovered that if you look at common metals like gold and silver and copper, which we all know to be very malleable, when you reduce their dimensions down to about one ten thousandth of your hair diameter, they become exceptionally strong, as strong as steel. So this is what I'm showing here, is that when you reduce the size, they get stronger. So smaller is stronger. Now, if we look at a different type of a material, and we make them in a different way, what we also discovered is that smaller can also be weaker. So here we go. You have a tuning knob, effectively, in strength. Sometimes materials get stronger when they're smaller, and sometimes they get weaker. Here's another thing that happens all the way down to that nanoscale level. If you take something that we know to be very brittle, for example, glass, and you take this glass fiber and you reduce it down to the dimensions of about 100 nanometers. So this is 100 billionth of a meter. And so what I'm about to show you is a video that's zoomed in 120,000 times where we stretch this glass fiber. And of course, we all know what happens to glass when you deform it. When you throw it on the floor, of course, it shatters, right? So here we are. We're pulling on this nano glass fiber. And we're pulling at it, and we're ready for it to snap at any point now. So here goes, here goes. Are you going to snap? Oh my goodness. It's not snapping at all. In fact, it's deforming quite a bit, and then it's forming a neck, which is what you would expect to happen in a metal, but never in a glass before it breaks. What that means is that sometimes materials get stronger, sometimes they get weaker, and other times they stop from breaking. But all of these effects emerge only at the nanoscale. That is at the scale of one billionth of a meter, or one ten thousandth of your hair diameter. And so back, all the way back to the days when I was a bad scientist, I thought, how can we make this be useful? Can we somehow harness all of these properties offered by the nanomaterials and proliferate them onto much larger scales? And the reason why we would want to do this is because it turns out that materials pose a huge problem for every technology. What I'm showing you here is all the materials that we know how to make today. And what you could see right away is that we know how to make materials be very, very strong. And at the same time, they have to be very, very heavy. Or we can make materials that are very lightweight, and by that, they will also be weak. So wouldn't it be great if we could start making materials that were very, very lightweight and at the same time exceptionally strong, this is what that target region is, that white space which we would love to hit. But if everything that's plotted here already that we know how to make today, how do we do that? So here are some examples of why this is an actual problem. I imagine all of us are familiar with a situation like this where you go to the store and you buy all these things that you absolutely need and the little plastic bags in which you put it just don't hold up. This is not the only example. From a wine glass that never makes it to the toast before shattering, to the balloons, which of course pop before we know it, to the, oh yeah, I really meant to have four children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All of these <laughs> are examples of materials that are very lightweight and very thin. And because of that, they're very easy to damage and to tear. So let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum. Let's look at the materials we know to be strong. The airplane, maybe some of you traveled here by one of these. And the tremendous expenditure uh, in the airline industry com comes from the amount of fuel that's required to propel a million pound machine through the air. So all of these materials are very strong. We trust them, but they're also very, very heavy. Let's take a look at some specialized materials. Here in California, of course, the solar cells and solar panels are very relevant. Now, what happens if this poor guy slips off the roof? This is going to be bad news for everybody in this picture. So the solar panels are going to shatter, and of course, because they're made out of brittle ceramics. So specialized materials are heavy 
and brittle. So how do we do this? How do we make materials that are both very strong, that we can trust, and at the same time very lightweight, if everything that we know how to build today was already plotted on that plot? So the way we do it is by introducing the concept of architecture into material design. And this is a particularly poignant image today as our hearts go out to the people in Paris. So let's look at the, at the Great Pyramid of Giza. This is the largest stone-made monument. It weighs about 6 million tons, and it stands about 150 meters tall. So this is a tremendously heavy structure, and because of its geometry, it poses a lot of pressure on its foundation. In contrast to the very elegant Eiffel Tower, which stands twice as tall and weighs a thousand times less. What you can learn from this is that you can build structures, engineering them in a clever way, such that they, don't, they have all the same mechanical robustness and structural integrity without having to use quite so much material and certainly a lot fewer slaves. So that's what we do. <laughs> And what we do in our lab is we build these architected materials, but in a very, very small scale. So we began this research by making micro lattices. What you're looking at is a nickel, nickel is a metal, micro lattice that's sitting on the world's most normal dandelion. There's nothing photoshopped here, and it's hardly perturbing it at all. And in fact, if I were to hold one of these in one hand and a feather in the other, and to release them at the same time, the feather would fall down faster. So they're very, very lightweight. But we're not just after the lightweight. We're after both the lightweight and the strength. So what we do in our lab is we make nano lattices. For that, you have to go down three more orders of magnitude in dimensions. And when your eye looks at it, you can't resolve any of these features. I'm showing you all of these, but these were taken with a very special microscope. So when you look at it and it's sitting on your hand, imagine a brick that the entire brick is made out of a cloud. So it's a solid cloud, and it weighs less than a feather, and it's just as strong as a brick. So that's what these materials look like when you, look, when you have them in your hand. So what that means is that this single material has every single length scale, from the very tiny, which remember how we had the size of the material that mattered, sometimes it was stronger, sometimes it was weaker, to the very large dimensions. So you're effectively wrapping a nano ribbon around a big three-dimensional architecture. So let's see if this would actually work. What I'm going to show you is a compression experiment on your coffee cup that has a severe case of osteoporosis. So this is a very, very brittle ceramic, which is very open and has pores everywhere, right? So we all know, of course, what happens. We're going to step on it, and it's going to crush, right? So let's look at it. So you can see it's loading up, and bam, it's crashed and burned. Notice, by the way, the wall thickness is 50 nanometers, so that's 50 thousandth of your hair diameter. Okay, so we have a little nano cemetery in our lab, so this guy goes there. Now, you saw that it, it, it uh, died, basically. <laughs> now, let's do exactly the same experiment, and the only thing we're going to change now is the wall thickness. The wall thickness, we're going to reduce it by a factor of five, down to 10 nanometers. So even more severe osteoporosis, so it should crush even more. Watch this. All right, we're ready for it to, to snap. We're now prepared. We know exactly what's supposed to happen. So it's compressing it and compressing it, and we're ready. And when is it going to snap? And it's really not snapping. Whoa. Not only is it not snapping, but it's recovering. So my student just made a ceramic that's 99.9% .9 air, that's completely damage tolerant, that will recover like a foam after you press on it. This is your brittle material, your ceramic, your brick that you know. Do you think that a brick would ever, would this would ever happen in a brick? So if that doesn't convince you that there is in fact a size effect at the nanoscale, I should just pack up and go home right now. <laughs> so it turns out that the explanation lies in how thick or thin that wall thickness is, right? So here's my question to you. So here's a building. I got this off of Google Images. And it looks a lot like our materials, which are maybe a million times smaller than this, maybe a billion times smaller than this building. Do you think that this building, if, you, if a giant came and stepped on it, do you think it would recover? No chance. Come on. If you build a concrete building, there's no chance it would recover. So it turns out that materials have all of these properties only at the nanoscale. And you really have to combine the nano size of the material together with the architecture, and only then all these amazing effects will take place. So the inspiration we draw for all this work 
actually comes from nature. It turns out that nature has had millions of years of evolution to come up with all these robust structures, like butterfly wings, for example. Their life depends on their wings not tearing. And if you zoom into this wing, what you'll see is that, guess what? There's a nano lattice in there. And a lot of the hard shells, crab shells, lobster shells, have this kind of underlying structure. And what you see on the bottom are three different images. And one of these images is biological, and the other two were actually synthesized in our group. And it's hard to tell which one is which. In fact, if I looked at all three of them, I would have probably thought that all three of them could have been biological, or all three of them could have been made in our group. So what that teaches us is that we can really start solving these problems and understanding how evolution happened by designing specifically the materials that we want with the same architecture, with the same materials as the hard biological object. So, you're all after lunch, everybody's relaxed, you're probably gonna be like, what is she talking about? So if you walk out of this room with just a single message, I'd like it to be this. If you are clever about using three things, one of them is architecture, we all know what that is. The second one is nanomaterial, so you have to go down in scale, down to one ten thousandth of your hair diameter. In the type of the material that you're using, you can start creating entirely new classes of materials, materials that you've never thought of before, materials that had never been imagined. And the reason why you would want to do this is so that all of these children, some of which happen to be mine, um, <laughs> will grow up in a world where we don't have hearing aids, where we can write the bone directly in your ear, and where your iPhone 83 has a battery that lasts a year on a single charge. And where balloons don't have to be filled with helium or with any other gas because we can just evacuate it because vacuum is lighter than air. And of course, your Christmas ornaments will never ever break again. And this is going to be our next company. So we all love chocolate. And I know you all had those, those uh, delicious chocolate cookies outside. So the next thing we're going to do is chocolate nano lattices, which are 100% taste, 99.9% .9 air, and 0.01% calories. Thank you.